But then if the elder, like the older people are doing all the things that have led to the meaning crisis, nihilism, financial crisis, then that's a problem. So you need an elder as a model, but the elder also can't simply be a personification of the zeitgeist. Well, hello and welcome to episode two of The Flanner and the Philosopher with me, uh, the philosopher, Joel Carini, Substacker at the Natural Theologian, and King Laugh, uh, to my side here, uh, the, the Flanner, as I'm describing him. And in this podcast, a lover of wisdom and an ambulatory social critic, seek the good through friendship and conversation. And uh, just as a brief intro, before I introduce our, our guest to this podcast as a whole, we did a, an episode last week, uh, sort of impromptu without fully introducing the podcast and its aims itself. Um, but it, it comes out of conversations that King Laugh and I have surrounding uh, philosophy, the Christian life, uh, the church and its purpose and its mission in our society. Um, not to mention questions about uh, natural uh, the relationship between theology and nature that I address over on my Substack, the Natural Theologian. Um, but you know, if if briefly given my uh, Substack, the Natural Theologian, my um, concern is that uh, Christian theology open itself up to sources like reason, experience, and nature uh, beyond just the Bible alone, um, in order to to fully have the a, a full perspective of Christian wisdom. Um, King Laugh's uh, emphasis is more on the church and whether it is fulfilling its you know, calling and great commission. Um, King Laugh, if you'd briefly introduce yourself to our audience and kind of summarize that that burden that you have once again. Yeah, so I, I sort of chose the life of family and the suburbs uh, over the academic life uh, out of necessity, and then had to figure out how to live the good and examined life uh, there. And the church uh, in such a locale often either doesn't philosophize or philosophizes poorly, however you want to couch that, um, but has certainly ceased to try to cultivate and develop mature Christians and especially leaders, relying instead on institutions that are poorly suited to that. And so trying to live well among the boy polloi, trying to make philosophy and theology uh, relevant, trying uh, to see the church live a life that might be described as something other than abstract or esoteric, something that genuinely does touch uh, the people in it and the place in which it exists. Yes, and I think there's also a, a formative experience there of both King Laugh and I uh, attending seminary and going down the kind of pastoral training pipeline, but sensing that something about that and then the type of leader it would teach you to be at a very young age, by the way, uh, would be not the full-orbed vision of Christian maturity and wisdom that we might hope, but something a bit narrower. For more on that, you could check out... Um, couple articles I've written, the post-theology nerd, or don't go to seminary for, for some of that background. Uh, but that's the kind of purpose and the set of topics we'll be addressing as the Flanner and the philosopher, uh, bringing in guests to discuss the same topic. This week, our guest is Daniel Garner of OG Rose. And Daniel, just briefly from my experience, is someone I've gotten to know through the Other Life community. He's functionally an independent philosopher. I know he runs a wedding venue on the side, lives on the, the kind of family plot and uh, raising and I think homeschooling uh, several children along with his wife, Michelle. Uh, OG Rose is their pen name together. Opperman Garner, not uh, original gangster. And so Daniel is a very thoughtful and encouraging participant in that online community. 
and has been an encouragement to me in my work. He interviewed me about my uh, book, The Natural Theologian. It's a great conversation and really appreciated him reading the whole thing, which I can't say to have done with his books, including uh, a most recent one, Second Thoughts. Um, I was searching for my copy of Belonging again right before this and couldn't find it because I had been reading it at some point. But, um, and I know you're rapidly editing another and you have several others out before that, including things like The True Is Not The Rational and so on. Um, but that's, uh, that's my broad general description of, of Daniel. Uh, I'll ask him to, to say a little bit more, but the top, uh, briefly, the topic that we'll be discussing today is this question of maturity and uh, the creation of elders in the church and society and beyond. Um, but Daniel, would you introduce yourself a little bit more, your backstory? Um, especially I'm intrigued to hear how you kind of came to be an independent philosopher. Well, that was such a marvelous introduction, and I appreciate all your support, and it's always a pleasure to speak with you and to learn from you. I appreciate it very much, and I love the podcast that you and King Laugh are doing. The last conversation you had was absolutely outstanding on the sermon structure and really thought-provoking, and I really appreciate that. So as you said, Opperman Garner Rose, Michelle and I, we have three children. We live in Virginia, uh, run a wedding venue, and we've been doing writing for, I uh, used to work in a wholesale photography business, all these different fun things. And how did I come to philosophy? Well, let's see. I spent my childhood lost in the woods, coming up with science fiction stories like The Sword of Tribulation or imagining myself in Lord of the Rings or Final Fantasy VI because the Super Nintendo RPGs were the were where it was at, the golden years. Uh, and, you know, increasingly more and more stories have become bigger and bigger and more elaborate. And those would inevitably entail various philosophical quandaries or ideas and so on and so forth. But I would really say that I would say a lot of the interest in philosophy emerged from actually little comments like I remember one time my grandmother, we were sitting on the porch because that's the place to be in the summer, said something like, um, and my father said the same thing as well, said, you know, no one gets married planning to get a divorce. And it was a very simple comment. But the reason why it was very profound for me is because you go, wait a minute, no one gets married planning to get a divorce. And yet when people get married, they're like willing to give their life over to someone. And it's like the, it's an obviously good decision. So the brain must not work the way I think it does. And that to me then goes, but wait a minute. The brain doesn't think the brain doesn't think the way I think it does. Good intentions can lead to bad results, but by definition, you have to use the brain to reach that conclusion. So you found yourself faced with a really big contradiction that arose very quickly, but not a contradiction as a logical contradiction, uh, but a kind of Hegelian contradiction. Although I didn't have that language at the time, where um, it started like a fifteen-year project of asking, "Well, does A equal A?" Like literally, that was like the beginning question. It's like, well, things must not be what they are, but it seems logically the case that a thing is a thing, right? So what's going on? Um, so that really began a lot. Um, UV went to UVA, helped to run an art gallery venue and performance place called Unoya, which is a word that can be loosely translated to mean beautiful thinking. Was And uh, it was also focused around a question um, as it was not an exclusively Christian organization, but it had a Christian um, bent that was, what does the gospel compel you to do as an artist? You know, like really kind of focused on this question of art in, in, in Christianity and in creation and the creative act and different things. And also that was very important because it, we tried to meet where there were no explicit signs that it was Christian. Uh, and then we ourselves were not trying to be explicitly Christian. So you were going to encounter otherness. And it was also incredibly clear um, to me that the more you increase diversity and difference, the more and more you, you find yourself misunderstanding one another and misinterpreting one another and susceptible to do what you think is good. And it actually ends up making things worse. And uh, Chekhov and one of, you know, once said that the key to understanding people that care about one another is that they perpetually misunderstand one another. Harold Bloom uh, says that so much of life is defined in terms of irony. And when you deal with difference, then you find that coming out. And it seemed to me as if there was basically no way to deal with the problem of difference than to think about it, than like philosophy as a kind of martial arts almost, like the art of relating between difference and otherness. And it also was clear to me that um, Christians could perhaps be tempted to deal with this problem by just kind of enclosing themselves around other Christians that share givens and they don't have to ask questions. 
And that becomes a certain enclosure to protect you from otherness. Because once you encounter otherness, not only do you have to figure out how to interact with otherness, but then you start reflecting on yourself and saying, why do I believe what I believe? And you become, it's an existentially overwhelming sort of thing. Um, but of course, it seemed to me that if you look at Jesus, you can't deny the other, like you have to be there for the other somehow. And then it was always very interesting to me, and then I'll give it back to you, is Jesus seems to be perpetually critiquing structural issues on how the church is done that results in keeping out the other while simultaneously making it moral to do so. This is the key. Like if you keep out the other and you don't have an ethic that makes it okay to do it, then you have to admit that you're keeping out the other and you can't look at yourself as a good person. But then if you consciously do that, you have to admit that you consciously did that. So you have to put it in the structure or you have to put it in the theology to have this function of self-deception be in operation. And that's where, to me, it's like, wow. But then again, at the same time, if there is such a structural problem going on, the only way to catch it would be to think about it. Oh, but the structure trains you into habits not to think about it. Oh, crap. There's a lot of factors at play that have to be worked on. And so I would say generally, those would be the places where then philosophy came to, I don't want to say, because the main thing we did for years and years and still do is like creative writing, short stories, like four no a number of novels and different things. Um, but then it became very clear that the stakes that literature needed to take on in general had something to do with otherness and the matter of the church had something to do with otherness. And we had to figure this out with our frenemy brain. Uh, that is going to make us susceptible to overlooking all of that. So that's how I would open up on some initial thoughts. So thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for that uh, description and kind of uh, introduction to some of the the philosophical, theological topics. Really, I mean, you know, I, I do think one of the, the, the question of kind of dogmatism and hunkering down with just our type and using theology to to create those boundaries. I mean, that is one thing that King Leff and I observe as um, a kind of intermediate, <clears throat> young 20-something, you know, theology nerd way of going about things. And, and churches can get stuck in that, but we don't, that doesn't seem to be the full element of Christian maturity. That is sort of this, you know, I mean, I think about in, in college, you are sort of determining, am I going to be a Christian or am I going to be not a Christian? Okay, so some boundaries are sort of necessary to be drawn at that stage. But once you are a Christian, all of a sudden you're like, well, hold on. Do I even have to be as mean to heretics as I was a couple years ago? Man, maybe I could actually be uh, kind to heretics, uh, gay people, uh, liberals, uh, etc. <laughs> we could the, the list could go on. Um, and that, that can be one aspect of Christian maturity. Now, still on the biographical element, um, it's interesting to me, you, you don't mention any academic philosophy studies. I don't know if you're just not mentioning that because, you know, I'm in an academic philosophy degree, King Laugh debates whether he should go get some such, and, you know, we wonder it, what are the prospects for doing philosophy, is the academic the academy a help or a hindrance in that? Should we not feel bad if we don't have its respectability and its letters and initials after our names? You don't seem to be subject to those worries, but I also don't know. Could, could you comment on, not that I judge humans by this standard, but ac academic background, like how did you, you obviously found yourself motivated by deep questions and philosophical wonder, but, but what role did academic study and training uh, play in that. I know that books played plenty of roles. You've read tons of books, but what about kind of the formal academic? Did that play a role I, uh, for good or ill and otherwise? Well, I didn't take any philosophy classes. I, you know, I like economics. I did English. I did, I did a religion and I was a Hindu concentrate. So if you want to know about the Ramayana, we can talk about it. Uh, but uh, I really, I would say that I fell into, so there were a few things. One, 
I did the Jefferson Literary and Debating Society because um, the um, be, because and that was a big deal. Uh, I really did enjoy that. And it's funny how I think a lot of the most important education is outside the classroom. But, you know, hard to say. Um, I actually wanted to do funny enough. Um, I was hoping to do like an ASL sign language translation certification to go up to Goldet. But then they canceled it in 2008. So that was really sad. But I really like ASL. Um, but anyway, um, so no, I, you know, I did a religion where I found a professor named William Wilson and did like 10 classes with him. And I would say he was like the intersection between literature, theology and philosophy, but it was very, 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 very different from how basically everyone I ever knew did philosophy or taught philosophy. Like we, you know, the class I started Christian vision and literature, Faulkner in the Bible. Um, he did, he did one on the modern state. Uh, he did one on the line of philosophy. I would say there were kind of philosophy classes in Wilson, which was like the line of thinking through Plato, the line of thinking through Aristotle, you know, Flannery O'Connor, Walker Percy and different things like that. And I also had the pleasure of kind of um, helping him type out his dissertation on Austin Farah, which is a masterpiece. I really think highly of Austin Farah. I also, uh, the beloved Vegan Groyan, uh, who uh, is, a, is a wonderful man and their friendship was good on the divine image that I enjoyed. So I did a bit in there and then Nimick was the Hindu concentrate. I had a lovely class with Kevin Hart on Wallace Stevens that was magnificent, um, who made me fall in love with Wallace Stevens. Kevin Hart's a great man. But that was all actually in all honesty, the way that they taught philosophy was almost like renegade. They're part of that old school that in a way, they were like, this whole thing is a mess and we don't teach it this way. We're going to teach it like we think it ought to be taught, basically. And so I was very fortunate to kind of find the rebel, in a sense. Uh, and then I just stuck with them. Um, so from a so I don't so for me, the sense of a formal philosophical teaching, I, it was more like I found a secret agent or like a few secret agents and stuck to them. But the majority of education, I would say, was um People like Vincent Zimmern, you know, Friends, Jefferson Society, Paul Chen, Arun, my, I could keep going, Bernard, I could, you know, this is the part where you feel like you're like, how do I name everyone? Where in these communities, like I'd live in the um, the coffee area, the walk-in of Alderman Library at the time and just stand there. And I found it was really important that you be in a regular place at a similar time every single day, because I don't have a cell phone. I really don't like cell phones. I think they're basically destroying us as a human species. Um, I think a flip phone is fine, but a smartphone is called a dumb phone, actually. Anyway, um, and it destroys focus. And if Simone Weil, McKilger Quest, Ivan Illich, and all that are big on attention and awareness being like the foundational um, in, in act for thinking, then if they destroy focus, we're in huge trouble. More can be said, but I'll pause. So anyway, you know, you stay in a constant location at a similar time working on the sort of tribulation. I would probably be doing that versus studying for essays because or, pay, you know, I really hated tests. I think they're the stupidest things like I like essays and tests with papers were fine. But if you were there, then you would have people know you were there. They know where you could find you and you'd have these organic interactions. Um, so I think that was extremely important. Then I, um, you know, stayed at Unoya for a long time and interacted with people afterwards and different things. So I know no real philosophy classes other than the secret agent of the great uh, uh, William Wilson, who I who I, I still see. I, I adore this man. Very, uh, very interesting. You know, I, I've got. More, more questions about this, but you know, um, it, it's it's intriguing to me that 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 I, I do think this is how one should relate to the academy is find the diamond in the rough. You know, d the fact is, yeah, we can have an uh, institutional critique of these things, but to milk it for all it's worth, you have to you find the people who are bucking the trends, and you just you know sidle up to them, and you know drink from the fountain and just get the get the best of what they can offer but i i do think that sounds sounds so similar in in certain ways to the way that king laugh practices philosophy which is through conversation you know he and i both did plenty of academic study you know by the time you know we started bachelor's degrees at the same time by the time i was finishing uh, my bachelor's degree, he was finishing his master's degree. So he's no uh, academic slouch, but, uh, you know, King Laugh, I'm wondering what you think about kind of Daniel's alternative path and if that gives hope to us, um, perhaps alienated from the academy kinds of philosophers. Yeah, I met a graduate student early on uh, 
in my first master's that had a very cavalier attitude toward the institution and its metrics for performance. Um, he was he was a very interesting fella. He thought that history was about telling stories, which is I've, I've discovered that that really is what it is. Historians like journalists; they don't actually like uh, historians. <laughs> so I love Marsden. Um, he's very interesting in the way that he writes. And he, you know, he was the kind of chap who would go to a restaurant and appreciate the pacing of the meal. Uh, you know, so he was tapped into some of the, the interesting rhythms of life. And he just wrote what he wanted to. He wrote papers that he wanted to write. And he didn't pay a lot of attention to some of the preening that goes on in those programs. Um, was never really concerned with what the directors thought. All the rest of us were, were relatively terrified. So... I think he had the right mindset. I suppose I view a lot of education as like learning how to make or repair guitars. It would be sort of bizarre for you to undertake that on a lark or because everyone else is. If that's really what you would like to do is make or repair guitars, then by all means, you know, go to a Lutheran school, but it's not the kind of thing that you would do. So, you know, the, the pragmatist, in me would say there might be a golden mean where you're able to remain in the institution and not completely abandon society, but still pursue your own ends. And that sounds like what he did. Um, but it is really expensive. And I think the cost that I have come to grips with in the recent past is that you leave kith and kin you leave the people that you've developed relationships, the people who know you. I think I've seen that life gets hard enough without having to ingratiate yourself to a new group of individuals at all times or the, the pressure that comes with having gathered together in pursuit of something that is a shared value. Um, you know, it's one thing if you don't like your neighbor. It's another thing if both of you spent tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars or more to come and be in a place that you think is going to be utopic. And then it ends up that, you know, their feet smell like everyone else's. So I, I think that it's a wonderful story. Anytime someone is able to pull from the institution, the things that they might pursue on their own. I think the, the concern that I have is how many of the people who perhaps are closer to the, the average rather than sort of being the outliers in terms of capacity, who are going to be able to replicate that. You know, to what degree, even given a good faith effort and diligence, are they going to be able to pull out of? Because I've seen that when professors talk about their students, everyone else is top liver, except the three that they think might be smarter than them, or that, that might <laughs> have some potential to benefit themselves or the institution. And so, you know, I, I think there's maybe a, a delineation that needs to be made between people who are, you know, we'll, we'll sort of Jedi-like <laughs> and, and people who are going to live an ordinary life and, and the sort of counsel that we give to people. Because, frankly, uh, everyone that, that has been talking in these contexts at least has the kind of dogged determination that is required to have these conversations, if not, you know, a fairly above average capacity. No, I don't disagree with any of that. And it should be noted that I think things have dramatically shifted. You know, I graduated a decade or so ago. So, you know, I think that is also notable. I think it is also dangerous to justify a system by the exceptions. I think also, because that happens all the time. Well, I had a good experience. Okay, but that could be used as a plausible den deniability to not critically examine what the system is at this point. I think that's dangerous. I mean, basically, like for me, the 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 beauty of college, you know, the, the I mean, there was a period too. So there's a few things. Um, there basically the beauty of college was as a social condition that had a self-selection of a bunch of people gathered that you could meet. And my focus was on meeting those people or finding those goals, aware that the education and also the certification was questionable in its value. 
Now, also, costs have gone up so much more. You know, also, now you have these online, and I know your last podcast was talking about that. Like, you have these online options, higher speed internet for people that allow you to actually get those socializations at a philosophy portal and other life of voice craft, which gives you the good of college without the call. So, I would never suggest going into debt to do those different things exactly with King Laugh. Like, again, in the same way that y'all were talking very well on the idea of perhaps the single pastor has some sort of historic role, Jonathan Edwards, when there's limited books, limited information, maybe not, but you could at least make that argument. So I think you can make an argument of the college having a similar centralization learning experience when you don't have the internet and Zoom and that justifying the cost. But under different paradigms, uh, college has to innovate. And basically at this point, in my opinion, the thing holding it up to speak very generally, and I'd have to just this, justify this in belonging again, is basically a monopoly on credentials. Like there are certain credentials you can only get. Well, we know in markets that if you have monopoly, you have bad costs, right? Costs go through the roof. I would like to see colleges basically have to compete with other ways of getting an education. And there just being a return of certification at the job you want to get by the interview or an employment test that has become difficult to do because of the Supreme Court ruling in the 70s on employment testing, and which was concerned about racism. I mean, very fair. But problems of racism have just where people where, where businesses would use employment tests to discriminate. Well, that concern didn't go away. It just went to the college level in forms of affirmative action, right? And meritocracy and all of that. So there is something to be said in a kind of Ivan Illich way of increasing competition between means of um, people proving that they have the ability to do the job that I think if college actually adds value, it should be able to um, survive that competition with online or alternative ways of getting education. And by breaking up that monopoly, the cost will come down. And then if the cost come down, maybe people are like, hey, I'd like to go to these universities because I can now afford it. But there needs to be an introduction of competition in terms of the certification, of which I would argue would probably make the quality of education higher, actually, um, because you would have to well prove that you can make people more competent than the guys learning on YouTube, for example. Now, that's a case that has to be expanded, but I just wanted to say I don't disagree at all with King Lap. And also, it's very problematic if basically, in my opinion, a lot of people who talk about having a good college experience and learning a lot the number one thing they'll say is it's about everything that happens outside the classroom. We have to think about that for a minute, though. Wait a minute. What? <laughs> you know, so the best thing is what happens outside the classroom. Well, that might mean there's some something here that needs some reform uh, or some different ways of thinking about. So I just wanted to agree with King Laugh. Yeah. King Laugh, any thoughts in response to that? Yeah. I, the, the thing about competition, the the stark reality is that we don't know how to judge competence. You know, they're the really, uh, we've relied on these standardized metrics for so long that we have not, we don't have processes. We don't have trainings. There's no, uh, it's a, it reminds me of guitar manufacture. There was a time where there were a few boutique manufacturers of guitars for the most part, and they were master craftsmen. And every instrument would have been sort of tailored to an individual. And as guitars have become a very popular instrument, the, the mass manufacture of factory instruments has meant the commodification of guitars. And so it's not just the people who manufacture them that no longer have the same refined ability to make them, but the people who sell them, the people who repair them, there's just not, there, there's never going to be enough of the people with that level and degree of mastery to service all of these. And so the, the process was never designed to maximize the competence. It was designed to maximize the number of people that could be exposed to a, to a sort of microwave meal, you know, Stouffer's dinner version of it. And so to wind that back, which I don't think is what we're really describing, we're, we're sort of talking about a democratization of it by other means, the, the, the decrease of the cost. But you're not easily going to be able to, you know, parse these and retain the excellence and maybe have this alternative method. They're just mixed in. And so there, you know, the, there's no way other than to have the competence to know yourself, you know, who actually has the mastery and find those people and do it. Or frankly, 
uh, you're not going to be able to monetize that that craftsmanship, that mastery, because no one else is able to tell the difference. Uh, it, it, funny enough, guitars, talking to a couple chaps that, that worked at Taylor for decades. And what they said is there's a lot of manufacturers who take $20,000 worth of wood and make it into a guitar shape. And they're terrible instruments. But nobody knows that the people buying it buy it thinking, well, it's a $20,000 guitar. How bad could it be? And so there's, you're never going to, you're never going to be able to compete with the market of ignorance monetarily. You might be able to pursue these goods and values. You're never going to be able to compete with it in a market context because that ignorance is baked into the price that the market is selling it at. No, excellent comments. So there's a few things. First, one of the, so there's the, and I think, I actually think it ties to the, the um, question of eldership because what ends up happening now is the process of gaining competence ends about 23. Then you get your job and you don't learn anymore, really. You really don't because like, why are you reading these books if they're not going to get you a job, right? Likewise, the likelihood of someone learning philosophy or learning logic or learning competence and how to be a human being or theology dramatically decreases in a context where you are made to feel like Ivan Illich says a deviant to learn these things unless you're getting paid for it, which by definition means that competence is probably going to be limited to the, to the PhDs working at a university system. And so that's going to limit competence in the system to think out, to think more broadly. So basically we don't have a continual process. People talk about lifelong learning all the time, but at this point it's pretty fake because if you create a system of values or implications that continually we're continuing to learn is basically a waste of time unless you're going to get paid for it, then lifelong learning is going to be siloed into the specialty that you're participating in the market. So then you have a limited, like, like King Laugh is saying, you have a limited supply of competence and that leads to all sorts of trouble. So one, we have to extend processes of continual gaining of competence or study that goes, I call it the midlife problem. Like right now we don't have um, social, a society that is able to think the mid years. The mid years is where you just work, you put your head down and then one day you retire and then maybe you'll be able to do what you wanna do. Under that context, you will have no elders because no one was doing the processing or work to be elders except maybe the people in the universities or who are or in a church context maybe who somehow are not habituated out of that eldership by the bureaucracy. Well, then that's going to be an exception. There will be a few, but they'll be, they won't be the norm. And so the amount of competence in the system that could spread or eldership or wisdom will be quite low. So you have to expand uh, the overall amount of people increasing the probability that people will engage in competence or wisdom practices, which is very unlikely if they are basically made to feel like if they go on YouTube and learn philosophy, they're wasting their time or they're not hanging out with friends and they're not sociable, right? Um, and so you also have an issue where the college monopoly on credentials would also remove the social association of thinking that the only way to get an education is to go to college and therefore get to debt. Competition also has a value change with it in addition to a price change that it brings about, right? And it would also suggest the possibility to learn on one's own, having the potential of bearing fruit, and you would have more competition of possible avenues in the society of which would increase the probability of overall competence or wisdom in the system. Kind of in a sort of, um, you could say, kind of a, a systems thinking of a Luman, and that would lead to someone like a hype or different things like that. So, I mean, the point is we do have a massive competence problem. Like you were talking about so well on the idea that if the congregation um, wants the pastor to be teaching the things that they are, you can't have a dialogue structure like the Bible might be suggesting. Well, then to have a dialogue structure, you have to increase the level of engagement of the of the social order, which is very unlikely if you have the political economy that's leading to disablement as Ivan Illich says, like disablement. And to describe that, and then I'll pass it, what, what, what Ivan Illich talks about is how in society today, if you say, try to build your own house, you're, you're seen as a deviant, actually. Because why don't you get the experts to do it? You're so prideful. Like, who do you think you are to build your own house? You should, you should get the expert. And so you are made to feel bad to try to build um, subsistence, he'll talk about, or competence, right? Like you see this in Christianity all the time. If you're reading philosophy, why do you need to read that? You know, aren't you just going to trust the gospel? Who do you think? You think you're so much smarter than everyone else. You're made to feel like a bad person. So you are socially disabled 
unless you, for some reason, just have the wherewithal to see through it, which is not probably going to be the majority, ergo the, the sum total of competence in the system will be lower, that then creates the conditions. Here's, here's where it becomes kind of Kafkaesque. That then creates the conditions where if you try to open up a dialogue structure of the church, the congregation will fail, therefore making it look like the preacher structure where one person is talking was actually the best structure because you've set it up for failure. So disablement sets up failure. And then when the failure occurs, it seems to be evidence that you that the status quo was right. And then you're now in a kind of Kierkegaardian total despair where you don't even realize you're in despair because, you know, this is just the right things to do. So for me, it all kind of feeds together where you have to have that change. And that gets into culture. You have to have a cultural change, which is then the weird question of what comes first, the uh, the ideas or the material, the the, the system or the thinking. Um, and, and that gets into like debates between McClowski and, you know, obviously to change the world by Hunter and sociology in general. So those are some thoughts. But I think King Laugh's points were very good. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, you know, that uh, was making me, me think of... Uh, the point about if you do open it up to the congregation, it just proves that you actually need to have one guy and only him talking, you know, it, like a Bible study. Or characteristically, you hear about a women's Bible study. And people are like, oh, did you hear what people are saying in the women's Bible study? It's what the verse means to them. And uh, they're starting to spread some crazy ideas. You know, we better, uh, we better, you know, just kill that. And maybe uh, maybe have a male pastor come in to teach the women's Bible study. So once again, the one guy is doing uh, doing all the things. And then your comments about if you uh, go outside the system, you're a deviant reminds me of many a thing. King Laugh has said, and I've felt personally when you sit out in a park reading a book or smoking a pipe in the middle of a work day, just thinking. People people are like, you know, what what are you? Uh, uh, a, a creep or you know you know looking to uh looking for drugs or like what what are you what are you doing <laughs> there, there's no place for that now i do want to make a, a pivot more directly to the the topic of eldership via seminary because i feel like so much of what we're saying here about academic institutions whether they're uh, fulfilling their purpose how they get commodified via the topic of seminary can really bear on this topic um because Seminary is a similar kind of thing, you know. We mentioned uh, Jack last week mentioned the seminary machine. King Laugh and I speak about the seminary industrial complex. Um, this just mechanical delivery of uh, purported spiritual maturity to congregations um, that are, you know, here, here is an individual with the proper credential now interchangeable with any other one with that credential who can now fulfill the role of, you know. Sunday TED Talk giver and, you know, uh, church books manager, and there you go. Um, and, and that itself, both in the way that it's, it kind of has to be simplified in order that can it be delivered over and over again, um, and that uh, it's now we, our, our sort of vision of, because the assumption is whatever that training was, that was the kind of expertise necessary to fulfill this role. So now the suggestion is that, you know, d depending on the kind of seminary, but broadly, theological, biblical training down to the original languages, for instance, um, at least in, in the kind of the, the more seminary focused denominations, there might be Pentecostal churches that have a, a different angle, like the kind I grew up in did not have that same standard for good and ill. Uh, but you know, th that suggests that a 25-year-old who graduates with that degree has the kind of competence they need for the rest of life. And that everyone, and now that, given the fact that anyone in a congregation is unlikely to ever get in theological competence to what that person accomplished in three or four years, and everyone else is just trying to play catch-up, um, but the, but, but the very assumption that what that person was delivered was the knowledge necessary for Christian maturity seems dubious. Once we realize, you know, once as post-seminary nerds, we, we hit the real world running and realize we don't have all the knowledge of how the actual world works or how to communicate theology to people in their context or 
where our theological vision was narrowed by that lack of wisdom and maturity. Uh, so that that to me seems like the 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 problem of of seminaries in some way. Uh, King Laugh, I I'd like your comments on that and how that leads to the problem of a lack of elders. I think it goes via the kind of disablement that Daniel was just speaking about. Yes, certainly. I mean, I think that I've, I've had to grapple with your point about the the pastor being the only educated individual. It's a particularly an American problem. Nathan O'Hatch talks about in the democratization of American Christianity that there was a time where we push back on credentials for attorneys, for doctors. Um, there, there is maybe some reasonability in that when you're a bunch of frontiers people uh you know most of the american churches come that aren't on the east coast come from camp meetings and methodists and the baptists uh you know around here the methodists have all the land so <laughs> still even you know not not that long ago that was the case i do think that in such a context an individual being educated serves a theoretical purpose, but I, I think it is a nefarious and pernicious development because what the church needs in elders is not incredibly educated men. It needs incredibly wise men. It needs men competent at life there where they live. And what I have experienced is that most of seminary training is learning even in Protestant, even in low church Protestant environments, all of the dance that goes into what people expect on Sunday morning, whether it's the Eucharist every single time that you gather or it's once a quarter, it's the same kind of, you know, learn what people expect and not tick off the old lady who remembers how they did it back then. Uh, and the other part of it is all the theology, all the things that make you fit for the denomination, all the things that are not going to tick the churches off when you get hired by them. You're basically making what McDonald's make. You're making something palatable that people know what they're going to get when they go. It's not going to be all that expensive. They're not going to have to personally be involved with the cow or the potato. You know, they're just going to get the thing and go home. And that's really what it's good for it's good the same way that the american education system is good in a Deweyan way it's socializing people to be good employees uh that pastor is just a at, at best a white collar professional at worst they are the janitor of the church uh they do a function that is high and lifted up only in the sense that and and this has been beaten into them that they never allow themselves to enter into it at all you know, that you might as well find, you know, someone whose vocal cords and ability to read are intact and whose mind has checked out because that is what the pastor is supposed to be, is just a mouthpiece for the denomination. The ones who aren't uh, seem to relish not being as much as the ones who are relished being. So there's, the, the trouble is that in the same way that burning the university down is not going to ensure that the process occurs correctly. You know, when you mentioned the charismatic denominations, I have met the oneness, oneness Pentecostals and their theology is, if anything, like you took all of the fast food restaurants in town, threw all of their wares into a trash can and just took a blender to it. You know, it's all over the place. It has no bearing on anything and root or ground in anything. It is just however they happen to encounter things like, uh, you know, like a man raised by wolves encountering civilization for the first time. And that's not to say they're not wonderful people. It's just to say that burning down the educational institutions isn't the solution. The solution is to address the problem, which is you, you live your first 18 years in a vacuum that is around people of similar age to know how to do a job. Then you go to another place where you're set free in Lord of the Flies to just be with uh, yourself and others in, in this formative way where, where there's really no connection to what the rest of life looks like. And then you get a job and, and you're busy with your kids. You're busy. By the time you arrive at where people might consider you an elder, 
at, at which of those points and in what way has anyone invested in you for the purposes? Uh, okay, education, maybe education. It's not great, but maybe education. Apprenticeship, not anymore. You know, leadership, are you leading in any way? Not really. You know, are, are you developing by effort, by critique, by feedback, the kinds of, of competencies and wisdoms that you need as an authority figure? No. And what we have done is we've just given authority to the highest paid person, to the most professional, the most expert among us, without any leadership justification even without any sense of apprenticeship. This person has only been educated and we're going to put them in a position of authority. And at no point in human history has anyone thought this is a good idea. It's happened, but it's always been viewed as disastrous. When it was the king and the king was raised, the prince, and he was raised his whole life to be king, there were still bad kings and we saw that that wasn't sufficient. We're now making men king who have taken a four-year degree course in being king. So it's so much worse. It's like a child becoming king. There's no experience in that. I mean, even the little experience the Bible seems to require of having raised and managed your family well can't be judged because these men barely have a family to begin with. Very true. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm thinking, as you're describing this, of w recently attending a, a basically dead uh, Lutheran church in the Chicago suburbs on a family vacation. And, um, you know, we, we went there to get a, uh, a stable liturgy that we, we, could, we could trust wouldn't be too uh, awkward or, or crazy. But, you know, that, that can sort of reverse on you if you go to uh, the, the, the dead old uh, Lutheran church, you know. The, it, it, the music was fun and all, but but the pastor kind of did what you just said. I mean, he's perfectly competent. He's been there for 50 years or something. His church is basically empty, but he's still doing the same thing. He's perfectly competent to read off the Lutheran liturgy, deliver a 25-minute talk, and do that. You know, I, I tell him at the end that I have a seminary background, and he, you know, starts telling me what he wrote about back in seminary and the last time he, you know, thought about something. And, um, you know, everything he, he studied there is kind of outdated in, in, in some sense. He's not up with a conversation, but, but you can tell that there's, there's kind of a disconnect there. And, uh, you know, what do, what do you get as a result? You get a, a dead church in this, this kind of zombified uh, vision of what the, what the pastor is supposed to do. Um, but... You know, Daniel, I, I've heard you speak often about kind of this problem of of character and like, what, does does modern society care about character? Um, obviously, when we exalt, say, economic values, then we, you know, we, society is, is seeking after something other than moral character. But I'm sure you you already had reactions and thoughts to uh, to previous things, so I'll I'll pass it to you. Oh, King Lion was fire. Oh my goodness. And that was that was hilarious. Um, on everything that you were saying with the with the church and the thought. I there's so much um that's outstanding. So a few things. First, on the idea of burning the university down, I think it's extremely important. Um, I'd have to make the case, and hopefully belonging again does, is that opposing something doesn't tend to make much of a difference. Um, or like becoming a leader in it, merely like, oh, I'm going to lead it and change everything. That tends to lead to totalitation. Like what it, uh, it's a kind of Kantian term, but changing the conditions of possibility, which is a much more patient and slow process that brings together, I think, the hunter faithful presence, but with ideas and activity, not just rationality in a kind of Heideggerian techno, technocratic rationality that has a certain, but a certain sort of faithful presence but then the issue is that it's hard to have something like the faithful presence that hunter talks about if you have a concentration like in a single person in the church right because you're not allowed to speak with any authority right so the issue with the faithful presence that has to kind of come out although i'm very sympathetic to it and it has to come out of a conversation basically mcclowski and ivan illick and hunter 
is that it is hard to have a faithful presence that can change conditions of possibility if you have a certain tagging of authority on one person because who's then trained and habituated to associate themselves as authority just because they know something that other people don't. So this creates an entire kind of social nexus that will not allow a single thing to deal with the problem, if you will. Like faithful presence alone will not do it. It's necessary, but not sufficient, if you will. Um, because then you have to get into the problem of, say, what do you do under the logic of capital, like Marx says, where everything is kind of commodified or we associate unembeddedness, um, disembodied intelligence, pure abstract knowledge as being the most important. And what you would say, I mean, you could get into Karl Planier with the entire logic of the societies of certain unembeddedness from common life. You were talking about the fights and there was some resistance of certification. There was resistance to markets and the creation of the market form. But now we have an idea that, no, no, everyone always thought this way. You know, the, the way of the commodity form is from a kind of utopian state of nature, what Karl Planier will say, right? Um, but then at the same time, it becomes very clear that there was a great enrichment in the 18th century that that has been attested to as being something to do with capital. But the question becomes what, for me, the question becomes what came first, the commodity form or the ideas of which led to the commodity form? Because that's going to sort of speak to the question of the great enrichment. And here's the key. If the great enrichment changes the conditions of possibility of the global economy, then there might be something in that episode that would suggest what needs to be done to change the conditions of possibility in the church or in the family or in the community. Now, that was a very broad thing I said, um, but I, I just wanted to I affirm um, King's point. Um, I was also going to say on the last, I meant to say this earlier, I do think it's very interesting on the problem of the sermon. And I think it just speaks to what King Laugh is saying about this one person having authority. Jesus doesn't do many sermons. It's always like parables in a kind of context of like a dialogue. The, I do wonder if the Sermon on the Mount was like a problem. It's like, oh, he does like one pretty short to the point of Jack's things. And is that a sermon? Like, it's very interesting because it wouldn't be. It's not like like a, it's not like he's telling you like a, like many times a sermon in the church looks like reading texture. Jesus doesn't like. Jesus doesn't, I uh, kicked out my microphone there. Jesus does not like unroll the Torah and read it, right? It seems much more philosophical, actually. It seems to be a much more um, kind of thinking, like what would it mean today in this current situation to think the revelation of Torah, meeting people in a situation that was not necessarily explicit, explicitly talked about in the Torah. So the closest example and I, I don't have my Bible in front of me to confirm this, but I, you know, I'm just, I was, I was thinking a lot about this after the last podcast is the closest we think we have an example to the sermon seems to be the sermon on the Mount that is outside of a dialogue structure. But then you could argue after that, even the crowd comes in. Right. And it's almost way more philosophical in its kind of way of talking than, um, than the sermons that you see in churches today. And then I think basically the big mistake is interpreting Paul as laying down dogma as opposed to situationally reasoning through problems that no one ever thought about before that Jesus did not explicitly talk about, but trying to stay true to the revelation of Jesus and Judaism at the same time while dealing with pagans who don't have any background. So you see in Paul, to me, Paul is the model of what Christian thinking looks like. Like it is the situational reason, staying true to a tradition, but also realizing that tradition is open because of the person of Jesus, which there's room for in the tradition, but he also sublates it in a kind of Hegelian sense relative to what we have to think now. Well, you take that model of Paul seriously, what a sermon is doing is different. And then critically, sir, Paul is doing what? He's writing letters, not just an or like it's a back and forth. People wrote him a letter, asked a question, and he's replying to it. So right there all speaks to a much more dialogue, dial, dialogos, dialogical structure than the sermon. And I think to, to the last thing I'll say, um, and basically that speaks of eldership. Like that right there speaks of what eldership looks like that is not replicated in the downloading of technique, techna, knowledge, intellectual disembodied knowledge, Carl Plonier, David Hume, Scott is Enlightenment, that kind of knowledge that is universal non-contingent and i'll just share it with you and no matter what day and time it is this sermon is going to universally be true that's not what we see in paul paul is not saying well here's some universal like um these some truths that are universally true that always apply abstractly and just do this he's like okay all right all right okay so what was that about the bread okay if the pagans aren't there you can eat it 
But if they are there, don't eat it because I would suggest they're God. He's thinking through the situations. And, and Jesus did not directly teach on the stuff in 1 Corinthians. Paul's thinking through and it's a, and it's a model of situational reasoning. So Paul, if we read him this way, is an example of eldership, in my opinion, of which, though, here's the problem, because as, as King was saying, the structure of academia and what we associate with being intellectual disables us from seeing Paul as a model of wise situational reasoning. We can't interpret Paul that way. In fact, we just see him as laying down dogmas uh, and that. And yeah, there's some sort of authority in what he's doing, but the authority comes from the work of thinking. It's not from just the appeal to a, an abstract universality. The authority comes from the work of thinking. And the question would be how to create the church in a way that it becomes better, where the, the church becomes a house of the work of thinking, not the resuscitation of abstract universalities. If the church is not a house or home of the work of thinking, and if the university isn't that either, well, then, it, then what's its purpose? And it's probably actually um, bad just like Jack was saying. Uh, it's probably actually more um, problematic. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to fall in the pit of saying they were stupid in the past. Oh, the way they did it in the past was dumb. I think what King was saying about the industrialization, it, had a, it easily had a role. It's a waste of time for the Christian to kind of go, they were so dumb back then. The, there was, it's over. They did it the way they did it. But the question is now, like thinking the now, as Hegel would like stress, like what does it mean to think the now? Whether or not it was the best way to do it or not, we can learn from it. We can see the, let's not judge over it, but try to think it in light of what needs to be done for the conditions of possibility now. So I appreciate um, those points as well, but please. Yeah. I mean, I want to <clears throat> pass it to King Laugh in a second, but you know, you've introduced this to me uh, under the label, the third Testament, you know, thinking about, you know, you know, somewhere around the book of Acts, you know, say, saying, you know, something phase three has occurred, you know, if, if the gospels going to provide us the, the new Torah, you know, the, here, here's a Christian faith, you know, here's, here's a, a savior being incarnate, dying, rising for our sins and, uh, you know, teaching through parables along the way as well. Um, now it is our turn. This is what Jesus is going to continue to do. And instead of viewing ourselves in continuity with Paul more than Paul is just the tail end of this uh, New Testament revelation. And it's, it's very interesting because, you know, we, we say that in, in evangelical theology, there's been an attempt to deny that it's the Islamic or, you know, even Latter-day Saint view of inspiration where it's almost it's direct verbal um every word but to allow that yeah the the humanity you know paul wasn't just in a trance with the uh, the letters just kind of coming out of his fingers you know he was he was thinking but then we interpret it as if it were you know the golden plates found in palmyra um as opposed to paul as a model of Christian maturity. I mean, and if Paul couldn't make it more clearly, he says at one point, I say this, not the Lord, <laughs> saying you've got to use your, your intellect, your reason, human judgment to decide on questions that Jesus didn't tell us about specifically, but we but he gave us the materials from, from which to, and we have to develop wisdom and maturity for which there is no shortcut. But uh, with that, just to, to kind of introduce that, that way of putting it, I pass it to King Laugh. Yeah, so at risk of, of of being Sherman burning down Atlanta here, I I think that we have so caricatured the Bible as to almost be as absurd as the Virgin of Guadalupe. Like we we've just gone so far down the road away from the, I mean, as an example of this, right, I don't think there's anybody who thought that the young woman was a virgin who was going to give birth to a child at the time. I don't think anybody was thinking of that. I, I don't think that we have to argue that everybody who 
heard the story of Jonah was thinking of Jesus being in the bell, uh, being in the earth for three days, right? I mean, I, God has his ability to hide and then reveal things within the word. Well, what that says is that there can be, uh, how would I put this? A, a, a communication that is ineffable to man that is still true. We don't have to have understood for it to be true. Now, I would then argue that when you look at the apostles and their use of the Septuagint and not the Masoretic text, when you look at some of the analogies that Paul makes from the Old Testament, when you look at just even the degree to which, as Daniel pointed out, that Paul is addressing very concrete situations with, 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 it's more about how he addresses the situations than what he says about those things. It's why we get so confused talking about women's head coverings or all the, these other things is that instead of seeing how Paul has reasoned and looking at the, the, um, well, the Logos, right? The second person of the Trinity, <laughs> the, the, the word as Christ incarnate, whose spirit dwells in us. We look at it as find the Bible verse that addresses, well, there's not a Bible verse that addresses putting pig hearts into people as a way to keep them alive. There just isn't, but there is enough, there's sufficient information for you to have that conversation and to faith. And you may get it wrong. You may get it wrong. I can't imagine when you look at the men and women of faith throughout the course of scripture, and you look at the information that they had, God was willing to give them less than the perfect information and to accept less than perfect action because it was obedience to the word that he revealed to them at that time. If you want to suggest that, that God was unjust in doing so, then that seems like a totally different conversation. But if he was teaching, part of what teaching looks like is focusing on the maturation of the individuals in question, the relationship that they have with the covenant God, rather than with getting all the nitty gritty details right all the time, and then enforcing this social setting where, you know, being unwilling to toe that line gets you ostracized. And I think that that is the difference is that Jesus is not, he says not one jot or tittle will pass away. So it's not that he doesn't care about the word. It's that the purpose of the word has always been the dominant and essential thing. And when we just show up at church and we listen to the Bible and we talk about the Bible and we make pious platitudes and, 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 you know, multiply them innumerably, but don't then walk out and live as Christ lived then it is exactly what he accuses the Pharisees of, which is this, you know, this facade that masks a dead inside. Um, and I think that that was something that, that I, I said to Jack that I think bears repeating. I don't care how. I don't care if it's a sermon, if it's pamphlets, if it's liturgical dance, if it's skywriting, right? It doesn't, if it's, Cirque du Soleil. It doesn't matter. If, is the thing happening, right? Is the thing happening? I, the, it, it just, we get to a place, I, I'm persuaded that you could not have a single thought about the Trinity and go to heaven. But you can't not love your neighbor and go to heaven. So now you can say, well, that's very anti-intellectual of you. But actually, I think that to be so in love and enamored, and actually Augustine beautifully portrays, this is getting lost on the mountain in the harbor and never reaching the fatherland, that it's actually human imbecility to be so caught up in something you won't, you can't fully understand in this life and will see fully in heaven. And to such a degree that you fail to live life well is not wisdom. It's folly. So that you can be a very intellectual fool. That is something that we don't, not only do we not understand that, 
there is zero attempt to guard against this in our institutions that prepare our leaders and authorities. And that is crippling because we're willing to take young men who are angry and abusive and neglectful and who don't have any interest in Christian discipleship or maturity and make them a pastor because they talk good and they think good and they don't actually, you know, they're not a good man speaking well, but that is what we, we, we've so eviscerated what true intellectualism is, what true wisdom is that we think that people who use big words and I'll, I'll never forget what, Hemingway said, I forget to which of his compatriots, but that, in essence, it's better to use small words. They're just as powerful. You don't gain anything by using the big words, and you lose some people. And if the purpose of a shepherd is to shepherd sheep, you can't speak in a language they don't understand to be doing the job. Magnificent. And uh, maybe I'll help burn some things down. So that was great. Um, so a few things come to mind. Um, uh, first off, on the point of the Trinity, and I, you know, my friend Kenny Grant once said that he believed that God honored misreadings. And I think there's got to be truth to that, uh, because otherwise salvation equals being right. And that doesn't seem correct. The word right and salvation don't seem to go together. And I think basically there then is the question of um, what is it that one does to be Christ-like? Is it believe in the Trinity? Now, I think the the it is correct to say that forgetting the Trinity can have unintentional consequences on, say, the centrality of community and relationship. And so there can be value in thinking of the Trinity. But it seems erroneous to say that believing in the Trinity uh, is, necess is more important than loving your neighbor. Um, and I think it also... You know, if we break down the uh, heart-mind dialectic, you know, if it, heart and mind are two sides of the same coin, did you really believe in the Trinity if you don't love your neighbor? Because you certainly aren't participating in a life that's Trinitarian, ergo relational. Uh, so I think that point is very well put. I think I would also say on the point of the Bible, like, if the Bible literally told you what to do on drone ethics, there'd be two things. One, you could no longer deny that God wrote it because it could time travel, so free will has been compromised. Or second, the people at the time who received the Bible would have been like, I have no idea what this is, so therefore it wouldn't have reached us. So the Bible could not be talking about drone warfare or internet or all of these different things without either restricting free will or being unintelligible to the people who would have therefore, in its unintelligibility, not carried it on. Joel, please, that's all you unmuted. But but but, uh, but don't you know about the uh, you know the bugs buzzing in the book of Revelation? Those have got to be helicopters. <laughs> They've got to be. Those are the drones. drones. They got to be. I wow. Oh, I'm so sorry. I take back everything I said. Uh, so you know. So the basically the key is the Bible. This is what's very interesting. If the if the Bible is going to have some sort of ability to work through history, but not be an abstract universality, it has to meet some sort of very odd middle zone of story that has principles, models of situational reason, model of character, but then enough mythology and mythos and story to have some sort of higher arc. I mean, again, if God literally started generous with, if Genesis was literally, a one-to-one -one explanation of quantum mechanics, there'd be no free will because God, you know, this is, there's no choice. This is it, right? Uh, and it would probably not be passed down. And also if the book entailed, if the Bible literally entailed information and instruction on every single thing ever, it'd be the Borges book that contains the entire universe. And when you open it, it kills us all because the scroll is as big as the kingdom kind of thing, right? And it would seem for Sola Scriptura in the most, um, radical form to be true the bible would have to be as big as that the scroll would have to be as big as the kingdom and crush everyone right? the map would have to equal the territory right well that means there's a problem because the bible has to somehow have authority without being a map that equals the territory and therefore is unreadable well that means it has to provide a, this is why i think it's so important that it ends with paul because that is the model of how to continue the work like, if it doesn't have that model, the book has to be as big as the world, if you will, right? It has to be the um, the library 
Babel, the Library of Babylon, I guess, and Borges, right? This is impossible. Um, and so it has to give you a model of how to maintain the Bible having authority without containing information that would remove free will and all these other problems that would arise, right? Now, this is where, to me, um, there could be an issue. So um, what seems to have happened? Um, I think Paul... And basically, you'll note a lot of American Christianity has trouble with Paul, in my opinion, as a situational thinker and the Holy Spirit. They don't know what to do with the Holy Spirit. What has basically occurred is that the Bible has become the third person of the Trinity. There's the Father, the Son, and the Bible. Uh, that's what has occurred. No, it's called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is very important because that is the certain animating principle of Paul's activity. And if this is sort of the age of the Holy Spirit, of the um, advocate, et cetera, so forth, then in participating in this is exactly what we have to do that Paul models. So living according to the Holy Spirit as a Christian seems to be modeled in Paul. I don't think that's crazy because Jesus ascends, Holy Spirit, Paul is assumedly a model of Christianity. And so what Paul does, there would be reason to think is something like doing what the Holy Spirit would have us do, right? Now, I think the stakes are very, very high because this returns us to the salvation question that was going on. I'm like, what do you have to believe? What's very, very, very interesting is we are told that the um, unforgivable sin, which is a pretty radical claim. What is the unforgivable sin? Blaspheme of the Holy Spirit. Not the Son, not the Father, the Holy Spirit. And this is the question I have. If you make the Bible the third person of the Trinity, are you blaspheming the Holy Spirit? If you don't model after Paul, is that a life of blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Because you are rejecting its work to return to a model of memorization that is in the Father and in the Son, but Jesus told you explicitly that blaspheming the Holy Spirit is actually the unforgivable sin. Could it be the case that in having a church that fails to model Paul, you have some kind of blaspheme of the Holy Spirit going on? Maybe. Now, I'm not going to say it's as extreme as directly out saying, I don't care about the Holy Spirit, but it may be on the same gradient. It may be participating in that mistake without meaning to in its very act of trying to be true to the Son, in its very act of trying to spread the word of God, of Jesus, it may unintentionally, to some degree, be participating in a life that blasphemes the Holy Spirit of what seems to be the unforgivable sin, not because God won't forgive it. Here's the key. It's unforgivable because you go astray from the place where great God's grace operates, right? You know, that's, I think, a key to it. If one is not working in the Holy Spirit, then one is, in a sense, outside of the place where grace works. And is it the case that the church is now operating in the place outside of where the grace works because it's not modeling eldership or what we see in Paul? Could be. I'm, of course, not going to say that um, that's, you know, that one could judge these things. But there is some sort of very interesting risk that could be at play if we don't really understand what the Holy Spirit is doing. Now, some people have interpreted that as saying you uh, you you give to magical forces or Satan the work of the Holy Spirit. I've heard those interpretations and different things and so on and so forth. But wouldn't that, aren't you kind of doing that where you say, you know, philosophies of the devil and you use philosophy to situationally reason? What if it's the work of the Holy Spirit that then you're ascribing to uh, worldly forces and principalities, right? So what if actually the way that the Holy Spirit works being through philosophy or different things that you're ascribing to Satan and the Lord of this age, what if that's actually the work of the Holy Spirit? So even that interpretation of the verse may um, may fall into the mistake. So these are things I think about. Yeah, no, that's uh, I want to get King Laugh's take on that before I move us to um, some questions about community and, and eldership that we can spend our last bit on. But, but King Laugh, what, what about uh, Daniel's take here on bibliolatry and the, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity? Yeah, it's funny. I'll, I, I had someone chant paper pope at me when I made a sort of Vardian turn in, in my undergrad. But I am persuaded that there is only one second person of the Trinity and that he was incarnate as the Lord Jesus Christ and that the Bible is, and this is a wonderful thing, but the inspired witness to the Christ, <laughs> to the word. 
Um, I think that we, when we conflate the word uh, in flesh with the Bible, we do frequently just leave Jesus aside and definitely forget the spirit. I mean, the spirit, uh, uh, I had an Orthodox friend who said that Protestants treat the Holy Spirit like the father and the son's dog. Uh, and he's not wrong a lot of the time. I think especially to avoid maybe some of the, the extreme charismatic positions. Uh, I, I had a, a Presbyterian recently, um, sort of almost with, with a pride in his eyes, call, call their church the frozen chosen. So <laughs> there definitely is this, I, I think it's the same impulse the Pharisees had and, and a desire to control. Uh, I was at a church one time. They were actually interested in discipleship. They were not outward looking. There was no evangelistic zeal, uh, which probably should have been a red flag. But the pastor would preach only out of his own translation of the Greek and Hebrew because the, you know, the translators were a cabal and they had a, a, an agenda and they were, you know, they were on about something or after something had an axe to grind. And what was clear to me is this individual who thought that the only way to understand the Bible was to learn the Greek and the Hebrew was not teaching any of the people in the church, including the other leaders, Greek and Hebrew. So there is this assumption, I think, that by tying ourselves solely to the Bible, that we free ourselves from the attempt to control God. But I actually think that most often, almost to a T, it is our attempt to control. Because it's still going to be one guy talking out of this thing. We're still going to be back down to a debate and a disagreement. And I think that there's a disingenuity to it. Because instead of then having a discussion where we, like Paul, reason in the spirit, it becomes people acting like it's not their opinion, it's God's. And then it just becomes this battle to the death over who it is that speaks for God. Uh, and that seldom goes well. It splits churches. It certainly has the, I mean, my own father's great penchant was to say, it's not my opinion. That's what the Bible says. Uh, and I think that ultimately that was a seed in what led to his death. Because when you cannot be reached by other people, I mean, in general, or other Christians, when there is no good faith argument that could possibly touch your soul because you have conflated yourself with God, you know, I don't know anyone who's good enough to survive that. We're not God. So thinking that we are destroys us. And it certainly destroys community. Because who can have community with God? You know, with a, with a, with a flawed God that's wrong all the time. Who, who can have that community? It's, yeah, very important. I mean, I was just paying attention to this Twitter debate in the last 24 hours about... Um, <clears throat> A, uh, a a theology conference or a Christian conference that brought people of different points of view together and allowed people on the stage who you know say things that are not you know hashtag true and the, the criticism coming that these are false teachers how can you let them on the stage um and I'm thinking to myself as someone who you know engages in philosophy that you know, if I had my druthers, I'd be hosting conferences with all sorts of people who say false things, uh, some of whom, you know, call themselves Christian, even, you know, and I, I you know, th th there are indeed passages about separating oneself from people who uh, live unrepentant lives. But, but the idea that, you know, we can set each of ourselves up as speaking for God and, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the critique of Protestantism that we are each our own magisterium and pope and everything, uh, that, that, that becomes very relevant. I think it's important for Christians to begin to engage in discourse where it is assumed that you are just a human talking. And hopefully the spirit is at work within you, but direct divine, perfect verbal revelation about this particular situation you do not have. So... That's very important. Now, 
time is, is, is drawing somewhat short, about 25 minutes left. So I do want us to pivot to uh, questions related to um, community. Uh, I also want to talk briefly about the Holy Spirit to kind of move us there. You know, I, I grew up with, as I said, a Pentecostal tradition where the Holy Spirit was quite prominent, at least in name. And the Holy Spirit was taken to be evident in um, personal emotion and enthusiasm. And I wouldn't say that the Spirit is never displayed in that way, but I came to the conclusion that that was an insufficient sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit, including because people, for example, would speak in tongues and then several months later uh, uh, leave the faith. And, and the, these things, the more seem to be necessary. Now, I came to the conclusion, influenced by the Reformed tradition, that the thing that was missing was the Word. And so, the, the Spirit is uh, always with, in, and under the Word, in a sense. So, where the Word is not being taught, or, or the meat, not only the milk, but the meat of the gospel is not being shared and you know, taught, that the, the Spirit is, to that degree, absent. So the Spirit can be found, therefore, in places that show less enthusiasm and more erudition. Um, now, we shouldn't totally leave that aside, I think, of the time that King Laugh and I were in yeah, the back of a, a pickup truck, and uh, along with several other young Christian men and a uh, half-drunk woman uh, came to us asking for a ride home so that she wouldn't be uh, potentially uh, harmed by the men she was with. And that felt like a very spirit-involved moment because moments before we'd been debating the Holy Spirit and cessationism and the like. Um, however, okay, if, it, if the Holy Spirit is not merely shown in enthusiasm, I've come to think now, Holy Spirit is neither just shown in talking about the Word of God, but in action, spirit-motivated action, and discipleship, and maturity, and wisdom, and all these other things that we're, we're starting to move toward. So, then we arrive at a question. This brings us back to some of the economic and the material, which Daniel has spoken about. King Laugh definitely has some uh, a take on. But, but I was thinking about it in this way, you know, if we think about the idea of an elder, one natural place to go is the idea of a tribe. In, in America, we think about Native Americans having elders. And so we have these small, you know, relatively smaller, uh, integrated communities. Um, we, we don't have the individualism of, of modernity and the marketplace where we can kind of separate out for, from one another or go off to college and separate yourself from your community or... Um, you know, in, instead of living an integrated life where you live with others and you work with others and you, it's all held together. You know, I, I go over to the gym over here to get my physical exercise. I go over here to do my economic production. Um, you know, I, I go to the bar to, to make some friends and I go to church to, to think that I'm uh, a religious person. It, it's, these things have all been kind of separated out. And so the idea of an elder... Who, who sort of brings all the pieces of that together and thinks about how to live well, well, the church has now become just one of these small sectors. And so the, the wisest people at the church about churchy stuff are you know, sort of expert churchy people. Um, so th they possess a certain kind of uh, expertise, but, but not this sort of full-orbed wisdom. And also, most of us switch churches uh, somewhat frequently. It's not this community where we've kind of always looked up to certain people and we're being trained by them to become like them and to sort of take their place. Uh, instead, this is kind of all disintegrated and that brings in kind of the economic and the nature of modernity. And, and then this, this hope that many people are having today, I think of the, the Benedict Option, I think of your title, Belonging Again, the, the hope that we could sort of recapture that sense of uh, home and membership and community and tribe and maturity and eldership in in some way, but the obstacles seem to be 
many. You know, if, for example, with some of King Laugh's experience, if the church isn't quite doing that, yes, you can be a faithful presence, kind of sitting around, waiting around, hoping that we can start some discipleship program or that you'll come across some wise person who will disciple you. Um, but if the system is not set up that way and people's, you know, spiritual needs are being met by uh, spiritual fast food and their community needs are being met by, um, you know, uh, perhaps nothing but Zoom calls or, you know, shallow interaction. Actually, Zoom calls tend to be a, of a deeper nature in one way, but, but, but shallow social interaction. And, and people don't seem to feel the need then for growth and discipleship and maturity and wisdom because you can kind of get by without it. Uh, so in, in posing the question, I want to, I want to throw it to King Laugh to, to only set up Daniel even further for his at bat. Um, but King Laugh on, on this, on this question of these obstacles to community and, and, and eldership. Yeah, I mean, I think the purpose of the church should be to help us to live our lives well. The actual community that we have with one another in the church isn't really about church itself being a uh, like an institution of competence. It's sort of a wrong way to think about it in, in my mind. You know... <sighs> There's not, when you love another member of the church, someone sees God, but not, not particularly in a different way than you loving your neighbor as yourself. I mean, the fact that you both are of Christ or part of the body of Christ is certainly relevant. But I think an ideal church would not have a, a permanent building per se. It would have a place to meet on Sunday morning. I mean, it's much less expensive to have a place to meet on Sunday morning. Most of the rest of what you do does not require a building. You're not a nonprofit food pantry or homeless shelter unless you are a nonprofit food pantry or homeless shelter. A lot of churches aren't. You know, they have an empty building. One of the things we've done in our neck of the woods is try to get more churches in the same building, meet a little different times, you know, have a bunch of nonprofits within the building because there's just no need. You know, the only reason that you can even talk about the professional Christian being the pastor and, you know, you're not a part of it is because we have one paid guy who sits in his office writing a sermon for, you know, 20, 30, 40 hours a week. And, and a lot of the rest of his work wouldn't require an office, you know, uh, maybe to do counseling. But, uh, you know, you could, you could probably do that a number of places besides in, in a permanent office. So we have institutionalized something that realistically looks more like a bunch of people gathering together. It is the act of gathering together and going through the liturgy and loving one another as, uh, you know, in a way that, that shows God to people who otherwise don't see him is the church. I know all the time we talk, oh, it's not the building, it's the people. That's almost a cliche, almost a, a, a sort of ironic little throwaway line, acknowledging just how far away from that we have come. That now there is a church on every corner, and if it isn't being turned into uh, a CrossFit gym, it's just languishing there until everybody dies and it does get sold. There's, there's no... You know, so what's the, what are the impediments? I mean, the impediments in part are that we're so affluent, we don't need each other. We can afford to have two domiciles instead of one for two or three generations. We, you know, we can like, and what is that? Well, that's in part because I think that, at least in my experience, women don't like living with the previous generation of women. And it's a mutual feeling, you know, and so they live in two separate houses. Well, that's the most expensive thing anybody could think to do. I could have a car collection or, or the nicest collection of musical instruments known to man and still be coming off cheaper than it would be just to live in two separate domiciles across town. But that's what we do. You know, it's, we have preferred to live nice places and both work instead. And when you do both work, there's no community of other women that are that are doing that even if you you are at home you're home alone men don't work le less than they did but the dissatisfaction with men men as domestic partners has increased why 
not because men are doing any less, not because they're not working hard. It's because there's no, there's no community. You're there with your children alone all day long, or you're there alone in a home. There's no community of people to go see. There's nothing to go do. So it's just soul crushing. Even if it isn't more labor, certainly it's less labor than it was before. But, you know, my, when my grandmother got up at six in the morning to cook dinner for or breakfast for everybody, to cook dinner at six in the morning, did it well. But to cook breakfast for everybody, she did so. There was a family of people that was going to go work in the field and they were all together. And, and we just, piece by piece, we preferred affluence and control over what we do with our time, over there being a community with whom and with which we spend this time. Take it, Daniel. Delightful. Um, that made me think of a lot of Ivan Illich's work on shadow work, where he talks about, like, throughout all of human history, the only way wage labor was possible was because you had people that were, say, at home, running the home, usually women he'll talk about, and different things. But what ended up happening with wage labor, then that all this weird double move happened where that work was still needed for wage labor, but it was simultaneously discounted as important, which then made a desire for people to only do wage labor. And so capital wins at the expense of community. So there's this weird paradox and Ivan Illich gets in trouble for that book, but what he's really trying to argue is that basically um, what has happened is that we all are already artificial intelligences. We already are just fungible intelligences, that there is no particularity or distinction or distinct community. Every community becomes a place with a McDonald's, Wendy's and Walmart. And there is no community because what value is community? The only thing that's valuable is increasing wage labor. So what good is it? And we are, and this is where then I think Mikey Downs does such good work. And it's true where Nick Land is basically like, you know where the logic of capital leads? It leads to the AI, logically, because AI is intelligence that doesn't need community or embeddedness or human. The process of Carl Planier, the counter enlightenment, all of these that they warned about, which makes a completely fungible world where everyone is the same, basically, as long as they're creating capital, that becomes rational which suggests that it really, really matters that your rationality be embedded in a truth that you select and not just absorb from the zeitgeist around you because it may lead to a world that you don't want to be in, but then you've lost the capacity to think an alternative because that's how you've been so habituated and trained. Um, so I really appreciated all of those points. And I really like the wording of uh, wealth has made us to where we don't need one another. That's really crisp. I think the problem today is we have to choose one another and people are hard. Uh, so we don't. Uh, and so we have to learn how to choose one another, uh, which I think gets in, you know, I'll do work with people like Lacan, the psychoanalysis, you know, the difficulty of the real. That's really hard. We've not been trained to because we don't have elders or a church that trains us in relationships to be there for the uh, for our neighbor. We're told love our neighbor, but not told how to love our neighbor. OK, that's really easy if your neighbor's Christian as well. But what if they're Hindu and different from you? Well, just say that they're damned and then you won't have to talk to them. Well, that's convenient. Uh, it becomes easy to love your neighbor if there's no diversity. And like I was saying earlier, like the problem of philosophy for me really arises on the mediation of difference. And that is what the church really needs to help us train in, because it, especially in a world where we have to choose the other, uh, because why would you do that if it's hard? It seems irrational. Well, you have to believe in something beyond the immediacy of the rational horizon you're um, habituated to, to choose something that I call non-rational, which sounds like an act of faith. Uh, and faith without works is dead. And here we see that the work is choosing the other in a world where we don't need the other. And I think that's very difficult. And there's much more that can be said on that, but I really appreciated it. On what was said about the church being a gathering, I think the fear is people have is that if you don't like moralize it as a particular building that if you're not at, you're a bad person, then you risk drift. You risk people losing the faith. And this is one of the great ironies because the irony is that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. When you turn the church into something there to make sure that people don't drift, the culture of it is one that people want to drift from. So it is very important not to engage in that irony where you have a church as a surveillance state to make sure that drift doesn't occur because that's a great way to guarantee drift.
instead of creating a culture that is following the spirit as modeled by Paul, which is going to be much more dialectical, conversational, taking on issues that the Bible has not spoken about. And it's much more about the gathering of people. Who cares what building it's in? Uh, we need a building, sure, but let's not moralize the building as the uh, center of the surveillance system. This then would make people excited. And, you know, it's very interesting to me. I have encountered very, you know, there's always this fear that philosophy will make people like stop being Christian. I've had like the exact opposite experience. Like a lot of the people I've encountered who take on real philosophy, not just criticism. A lot of people conflate like criticism as philosophy. No, no, philosophy has really the pursuit of truth. I've never seen those people drift. Uh, I've seen them become like, why do I go to church? But that's very different from drifting from the spirit. So it's, an, it's a great irony. That has occurred, actually. But of course, that makes sense if what we see in Paul um, is someone who's engaging in situational reasoning and thinking. And I think you mentioned how it comes about action. Yeah, you see that in Paul. I mean, you see a man who's walking, who's moving, who's meeting communities, but he's also having a whole lot of time for a whole lot of thinking in dealing with situational reasoning to know how to act. He's thinking to know how to act true to the revelation. So you can never take away the acting part of thinking because, um, because you know, thinking without works is dead too. Um, I And I really appreciate those points. Um, I think also on the idea that spirit has come to be associated with emotion. Well, hold on. I'm assuming that Paul is filled with the spirit, right? I think that's a pretty safe assumption. He seems like he's sitting and writing. Is that is that okay? Is that filled with the spirit? Because it looks like the filled with the spirit can take a lot of different forms. It can look really scholarly, actually. Now, there are other contexts where it can look more emotional. Do not limit what it looks like to be filled by the spirit. If you do that, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to limit this, what, the, what being filled with the spirit looks like in line with the zeitgeist of the current age, which today is very neoliberal and postmodern. And in postmodern, although... True postmodernity is more complex than this, but if you grant me on the caricature, a whole lot of emphasis on expression, on showing your personality, well, that tends to be what the spirit becomes. It becomes a following of the logic of um, that certain crude postmodernism and neoliberalism as another crude version that then we come to read as being the acts of the spirit when really it might be the hijacking of the zeitgeist. And in Paul, there would be the situational reasoning to make sure that doesn't occur that we sometimes can, um, that we can miss. I think to um, Laugh's point um, to uh, King Laugh's is that the church is supposed to be an enabler of life. And if it's disabling you to feel like you can't do philosophy or you can't say do art or you can't think about these things without being a bad person, then it is probably not, not an enabling force. It's probably part of the disablement that Ivan Illich talks about. I think also on this emphasis, you know, I put a big, big, big emphasis on free speech and belonging again and the ability to speak freely, which is an act of speaking. And it's funny that we associate the spirit with tongues, because I think basically if you have a church structure that makes it, you can't talk about that. It's not in the Bible. The pastor is the only one allowed to speak. That would actually be a place that removes the possibility of the moving of the spirit. But we are able to rationalize that lack of the moving of the spirit if people are emotional which then comes to function as justification for the structure that limits the movement of speech and of the tongue, if you will, that then actually removes us from the model of Paul that seems filled with the spirit, that then disables us from the situational reasoning that we need to not drift from the church, if you will, but to actually be excited by how the spirit is working and to how to think today. So associating community with the freeing of speech not just free speech, but the freeing of speech. Free speech is not merely the law where you're allowed to say something and not go to jail. Uh, you know, it's the ability to speak freely and not feel like you're uh, going to go in trouble. And the ability to speak freely when it's removed from the church, I do think it becomes questionable to the degree that the spirit can move through it. Um, and so those things are tied together. So a community of freeing speech, because I think it is hard. There's more to say, but I'll pass it on. Um, I think it is hard to have community if people don't feel like that they're free to speak. And I think it's hard for people to pray if they don't feel like they're free to pray. Uh, and it's hard for people to see what God is doing if there are some areas off limits. And I think basically then the role of the elder is to maintain a space of freeing speech. And whenever they see people are in the way of that, they stop it. 
They shut down anything that's trying to shut down the freeing of speech. The great horror is we've made the elder the exact opposite. We've made the elder the one who limits speech and the movement of thoughts and the spirit as keeping us to the Bible, keeping us to the pastor. And they become the mechanics of the surveillance system, as opposed to making sure that nothing is stopping the movement of the spirit, of which we can trust them to do because they have the experience and situational reasoning to identify if that is being employed correctly in the community and that it is leading to an enablement of life because they are able to think like Paul from experience and wisdom revelation life and all these things together and make sure the community is doing that and then bringing it to action in the world. Uh, so I think eldership becomes critical in all that. That That is great, Daniel. I'm thinking of that comment about creating a, a space in which speech is free and we can freely speak with one another. And I think, you know, the, the, the sense of people having a facade up at a, at a given church is, is a sign that community isn't really occurring. Uh, you know, if, if there are people with whom I must hold my tongue and whom, with whom I've never shared anything deeply or personal, uh, then is this really the church? Is this really Christian community? Um, now, I, th I, I want to move us briefly toward solutions and, and potential answers, um, though time is short. So if we can each comment briefly on it, um, you know, for me, one of my ways of, of solving this problem, which I'm still in process on, is to dis disassociate these ideals of, of Christian life from a single local church itself. So to recognize, for example, that to continue on your, on your theme, I should think about the people with whom I already have this kind of relationship of, of free speech, uh, the, this relationship where they've spoken into to my life, you know, where I'm free to speak into their life. Um, and when I think in those terms, there is a, a small group of people who even qualify as elders with respect to me. Um, they Are they the elders of the church I attend? Not, no. Um, are they, that's nothing against the elders of the church I attend. It's just like the fact that, you know, I, I moved to this area for technically capitalist reasons. This is where the, the degree that I got into was, and I moved for a job and, you know, I've only been here so long. We don't know each other that well. So are the, are the elders at the church I attend on the street corner going to be elders in this deeper sense? No, that would take a, take a long time to to develop and you know there might be a, a mismatch um but if but i think about who with whom am i actually in that relationship i can think of some people and there was an earlier phase in my life when i would have had to say no i can't think of people but i need to develop this and and so so i think sort of taking steps individually to find people who can functionally be one's elders you know they can be mentors or or something and then ideally to embed oneself in a community where they are present to find some some match there um and, and also you know in, in any place th there's just no need to limit ourselves to the fellow congregants at a particular congregation you know somebody i mean online obviously might be someone a great interlocutor on matters of the christian life and an encouragement and and so on. Or, you know, if I've been to more than one church in a given area, I might retain friends from one church. I might, there might be somebody I, I connect to. And, and all of a sudden, my, the, the, my church is a sort of cross-section of, of multiple Christian circles. You know, maybe a Christian college that I once attended or, um, you know, it, it can come from different places. But I think that while there is an ideal that the institutional church would embody these things, it's also incumbent on us to get them in our lives regardless. Because, you know, we can't wait for, um, you know, society to re-tribalize in a nonviolent way and <laughs> somehow have like 
wise Christian elders in a uh, a small Amish tribe or something like that's that's not in the uh, in the cards in the near future. But you know we are in those middle years and must be growing in maturity in in into the kind of thing we think of as an elder. So we we just have to take it upon ourselves to define that. So that is in in part my temporary answer. The only other piece of that being um, that recognition of the need of others is something that I and my wife have been coming to quite recently, which may inspire uh, action on our part. Uh, but but that sense that actually I, I do need to make sure I am I am near people whom I uh, ha have that kind of community uh, uh, with. So those are a couple of my answers. I want to I want to pass it to King Laugh and then and then finish with our guest. Yeah, I was talking to a, a couple of older men who are going to become elders here in the near future at our church, which does not currently have elders, SBC Church. Um, both of them said they didn't have any mentors in their lives. Um, I think this this may be a you know four plus generation problem of not having any. Mentors, but I do want to distinguish mentors from elders. I think elders are a geographically bounded phenomenon. I, you know, I think that you have to have a, a reputation in the community, which means you have to have some roots put down somewhere. This isn't just all the all star men of a church, this is a specific subset of them who have a reputation in the community, who have a certain track record with their families, who have served that church in a way that they can be trusted with some of the most delicate matters. And so, and I think that's one of the reasons it says don't make a new convert. You know, if C.S. Lewis recently converted, you don't make him an elder because there's, there's a specific role. I think that that is helped when we realize that the whole church is supposed to be serving. You know, I, I got asked recently, what do you want out of discipleship in the church? Do you want to, to receive something or do you want to give something? I said, well, certainly it's going to be both, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's this great chain of immaturity to maturity. And I, I imagine only the very oldest of people are thinking wistfully of their Barnabas that recently passed. You know, th there's just this need for us to realize, I, and, and it's funny, I, I will quibble with, with Paul as an elder. I think Paul as an apostle is doing something almost more like a Jedi. You know, he's telling Timothy, go and, and make sure there are elders in this town, but, but he's not really staying. He's, he's moving, he's establishing, he is addressing issues. But I think that the elders are there so that the issues that reach Paul are the very most difficult, most intractable, you know, most contentious issues. We, we need people like Paul. We do need the scholars. We do need people who are thinking very carefully about the issues of the day and can respond to that and aid the elders who may be wise, who may know, but who are not necessarily going to have that degree of specialization. It's just, when there is a place, I mean, I live in a county where it seemed like there was not a group of elders in any church in the entire county. And then, and that's where I have to fall silent. I don't know what you tell someone besides move or, or find some, some word because you can't fly in wise men from elsewhere to be this thing we're describing. It takes time. I think that's why Timothy came. And, and established elder because it took time. It took an investment. It took some some really heavy hitting, high caliber individuals to do the work of cultivating that. So I think the solution is actually that we send the people who can be trusted, maybe two by two, to places that don't have this to cultivate it. Because I don't think that you can just fly it in by helicopter or cobble it together from elsewhere. You can get a lot of other things, but I think you actually have to build it. The point being, what we need is not a, a random helicoptered in a church plant with one, you know, young individual, but <laughs> we need the, the cultivation of uh, disciples and elders 
in, in the places where Christians are. But I, I, I take it. Daniel. Well, this has been a delightful conversation. I appreciate the opportunity. So thank you, King Laugh and Joel. This is uh, this has been a treat. Um, you know, uh, something that Bruce Alderman said and, and Layman Pascal and others, and I've, and I've read it elsewhere, that kind of when they talk about eldership, it has something to do with a certain um, dwelling in a different flow of time. Whereas we tend to be bound in a sequential linear time or where this present moment is the greatest moment and we're the smartest ever, or this is the worst moment ever and we're all going to die. The elder is able to see something a little more big picture. We could say dwelling in the Kairos, dwelling in the eternal time, where they're able to see cycles, but they're also able to see patterns repeat, but they also are not certain like saying there is no progress because the elder knows that actually the spirit is working. So it's naive to say there's no progress, but it's also naive to assume that everything is progress that occurs because that's when you become um, enclosed in the technological essence or something. So there's something about for me where the elder is occupying, I like this emphasis on geography, they're emphasizing a certain geography of eternity, a certain geography of time. And I would, for me, put an emphasis on this kind of time in the elder. And I think for me, to King's point, I think the elder today is a dweller. It could be the case, I, I would say, that in the past where nobody was traveling, uh, that that was actually what played the role um, in like a Paul, he's traveling a lot. There could have been something there, although I appreciate the point that an elder has some sort of continual relationship there. It is possible that because the traveling is what was lacking, that was the experiential knowledge that people lacked and they were more susceptible to an enclosure of their immediacy, that that could have helped people see the operations of eternity unfolding in history. Whereas today, all anyone does is travel and gather in experiences and nobody wants to dwell and everything is fungible and there's no community. I, it makes me think of Emerson talking about how travel can be bad for the soul and destroy the soul because you're not able to dwell. It is definitely the case that today, an elder for me has to resist the temptation of gathering endless experiences like a, like glass beads or Pokemon that they can show off. And oh, I'm an elder, elder because I've seen the most continents or traveled the most places or lived in the most locations. I've moved around the most. No, that today seems to be the deformity. You could say that there is distance and depth. If you're all depth, you don't, you're deep, but you don't go anywhere. But if you're all distance, then you're very shallow. And the elder, I think, has a certain situational discernment to identify when a community or when a time such as this is too much on the side of distance or too much on the side of death. And today, as Ivan Illich said, who I've referenced a lot in this talk, there's a real emphasis on the need for dwelling because that's what people, well, let's put it this way. The children tend to assume that what the elders, the older people do is what they should do, or they rebel. Well, we talked about earlier that rebelling doesn't get you anywhere and usually plays into the logic of the capital nation state of Koratani talks about. But then if the elder, like the older people are doing all the things that have led to the meaning crisis, nihilism, financial crisis, then that's a problem. So you need an elder as a model, but the elder also can't simply be a personification of the zeitgeist. They have to be the one that dwells in this bigger unfolding of time, which you could say the spirit in history. Um, you could say the elder rejects the logic of the day, but they don't demonize it. Let's put it this way. They hold it with an open hand. They don't assume that because it's new, it's bad, but they also don't assume because it's new, it's good and hold it with a gripped hand. It's like Michelle talks about the bird. The older holds the present with an open hand, which requires balance and is very difficult. Like a bird sitting on your hand that you let come and go, trusting that if your hand is there, they can come to it. So the elder holds things in this way. And I know we're coming on the end. Um, so those are, those are some thoughts on the, on the idea of just agreeing with the notion of the elder today having to be a dweller, because I think that's the case. And is, and is actually the changing of the conditions of possibility in a world that's drunk on gathering experiences and traveling distances and seeing the most places to put on social media and actually is commoditizing experience itself. How does an elder be an elder in a world that commoditizes experience where well, they have to really have a root in that unfolding of, a, of a, an eternity? I think I'll, I'll say one thing. I really like that idea of the conflation of like, you know, it was said earlier where basically if I know the Bible and I can recite the Bible, 
then I'm God. You've conflated God and Bible in a way, and then therefore the pastor becomes um, the pastor becomes God. The elder is someone who has authority without conflating themselves as God, which is radically different because that means you have to be able to reason or meet a person at where they at that seems like a miracle because how could they meet me in my exact moment, exactly what I wanted to, to hear? How were they able to discern that it feels miraculous? So the elder gets a kind of miraculous, an uh, elder gets authority from a certain miracle as opposed to appeal. The elder is able to discern this is where you are and it feels miraculous when they meet you there versus appeal to an authority that means they're basically a dictator. So an elder is someone who meets. I think the elder also is someone that keeps you moving without falling into a, li a certain logic that encloses you. An elder discerns when you are enclosed. This would mean structurally that the elder is in the business of actually the situational reason. They would have to be someone who's engaged in a lifelong learning. But they are also, here's the key. The key to the elder, because we mentioned free speech. You don't need free speech if you like everything that everyone is saying. Free speech is precisely meaningful because people say things you don't like to hear, okay? And that's precisely what tempts us to shut down free speech. And it was said other earlier that um, Jesus loving the neighbor, which in the parable of the neighbor, when Jesus answers that is in the context in, in Luke, I believe, uh, of the story of the Good Samaritan who are enemies, uh, of the Jews or who are trying to kill. So you're basically saying the neighbor is someone who might destroy you. They're not like you. They are truly other and it is difficult to love them. Well, free speech, which would be, I think, the movement of the spirit thus requires the other who is hard to love. The other is the one who's hard to hear. And they have to be part of the community because otherwise there is no other that is hard to hear. The elder is the one who can discern the other that you can handle without being destroyed. But they won't let you avoid the other, but they also don't put you in the presence of another you're not ready for. So this, and this is a very tricky thing that to me speaks to the Dante Beatrice model. Dante asks Beatrice in the Paradiso, why don't you smile? And she says, if I smile to this early on, fully, it will destroy you. It will reduce you to ash. So there's a gradual developmental process that Beatrice realizes she has to meet Dante, where she smiles just enough where he keeps ascending, but not so much that it destroys him. An elder has training in this art of unveiling, and they are trained to discern the particular spiritual place of the person and the kind of other they can handle without being overwhelmed, but also not let them fall into avoiding the other. And that is what keeps free speech alive and thus freeing speech alive. And so the elder has a role of discerning the amount and kind of otherness that people can handle that will force them to confront the neighbor of whom if they do not love, they cannot be like Jesus, but to do so in a manner they can handle and to do it as a lifelong process. And right there, that means there has to be dwelling because they have to dwell with the person to help them on that process. So to close, the elder is not someone who's giving you the right beliefs, but is discerning the process of gradual unveiling of the other, of which then is to say you can handle this so you can act on it. Thus, it is thinking to discern the level of unveiling to make possible action that then when that younger person succeeds in this, they then feel more competent to handle more and more otherness and more otherness and to be more and more like Jesus. And the elder is discerning that process of unveiling that they can handle and then forcing and then encouraging them to pursue it so that they can more implement that love that moves the sun and other stars. Great, great words. I'm thinking uh, briefly, I, I didn't expect the themes of uh, dwelling and free speech to to play so prominently. But, um, you know, I'm thinking of like uh, King Laugh's comment about about a Jedi. Um, there, there is per perhaps a Gandalf role and in intellectual can play, but an but an, an elder is a bit more homegrown. Yeah. Um, but this this elder must have a sort of breadth of experience. To, to help, for example, the hobbits to know that, that things are different elsewhere and to, to not, not uh, show them all of those things all at once, but to be ready to, to help people mature from the simple naivete of, of hobbitness to 
you know, the maturity that a Bilbo or a Frodo gained over the course of their journey. So um, maybe with one word from uh, Lord of the Rings loving King Laugh, uh, we, we, we will finish up. Any, any thoughts on the Hobbit versus Gandalf? Yeah, I, I think I wanted to oppose our age's penchant for deceiving people with a kind of brutal honesty that drags people to the edge of the abyss and compels them to gaze into it. And I think that what Daniel's saying is, is sort of a, a brilliant wisdom of this being more of a, of a seduction, of a wooing, of, of, a, of a shepherding, where all of the cards are not immediately revealed. In fact, that is part of the the skill learned to become an elder of meeting people where they are. And like God does with humanity, look at the Bible and, and how much of it is is this sort of incremental revelation. There, there are still mysteries. Paul talks about the milk and the meat. And so maybe out of a desire to not be accused of deceiving people, I think that I've wanted to just present them with the raw reality of it. Uh, and maybe that is a selfishness. Maybe that is a, a pride of, of wanting to not be accused of anything. But the vulnerability that I think an elder exposes themselves to is possible because of the security they have in the process and their competence to do it. I think maybe the insecurity is what makes you know, all the accusations of elders being, you know, a cabal of power that, that is reactionary and defensive. Well, yeah, if you've got a bunch of middle-aged men that have barely raised their kids and, and if, like, this is their new thing and they haven't done it ever, then, yeah, when you accuse them of being this or that, they're going to respond poorly. So that, how did, I mean, that's the thing I'm going to keep thinking about is how do you develop that process where by the end of it, you, you are like a grandfather with grandchildren showing them the wonders of the world. So thank you, Daniel. I I, I went mm, obviously I'm muted so you didn't hear. I went mm, and cackled maniacally at at so many things. I don't think I've met someone where I agree more with them than my own ideas so much. So it was a pleasure. <laughs> I enjoyed every minute. I love what you just said on vulnerability. That's spot on. Uh, because if because the temptation to show everything so they can't accuse you of being in the wrong, there's a vulnerability that the elder has to sit in that's mixed. Which is, I think that was a brilliant comment. I've really enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure to meet you, King Laugh. And Joel, I've really enjoyed the invitation. Just wonderful, wonderful. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, this has been The Flanner and The Philosopher. I'm uh, looking forward to coming up with a clever title for this one. But the, the question of elders and maturity, and I think this will be an ongoing one. Um, ultimately, a question of how to live the philosophical life under the contemporary conditions. So looking for the possibility of, of conditions of something else, I think, is, is very key. So with that, thank you, Daniel. Appreciate your contribution. Thanks, Kim, King Laugh, for uh, your contributions as well. Uh, I'm Joel Carini, the natural theologian. Until next time.